All right, welcome in everyone to our Native Strong weekly town hall or bi-weekly town hall on the Native, or uh, sorry, COVID-19 pandemic and ongoing, uh, consistently changing uh, updates and whatnot that we've been uh, dealing with now for a uh, little over 18 months. Um, as usual, we have our uh, featured speaker here, Dr. Lyle Ignace of the Gerald L. Ignace Indian Health Center, taking time out of his day and his week to uh, kind of bring everything into focus here on the data and the numbers and what's new, what's going on. Uh, and normally our moderator, Mark Denning, would be joining us today, but uh, he is indisposed this week, so he will not be here. But um, as always, we do welcome questions. We encourage questions. So if you're joining us via Zoom, if you're joining us via Facebook Live, please uh, drop in a comment or question uh, as we're going along here and we will get to it uh, at the end in our Q&A. Um, like I said, uh, you know, nothing is, there's no stupid questions, uh, you know, so just, uh, you know, throw something out there. If there's something you need clarifying or, you know, interested in, uh, let us know and we'll try and get to it uh, towards the end here. Um, so we'll get into it. Uh, thanks again for joining us, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Nace, for uh, being here today. Uh, thanks, Jeremiah. <clears throat> yeah, Mark is uh, out, of, out, of, uh, out of state, indisposed, uh, uh, helping uh, Native communities uh, somewhere else. So, but welcome back um, to Native Strong Town Hall. Um, and I'm going to change things up. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be giving all kinds of highlights as to what's going on. And we all know and understand. So this is more of uh, follow up, follow ups to what we have seen in the past. In particular, um, um, a news article that I that I came across uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, Navajo Nation. Um, out of Winter Rock, Arizona. <clears throat> so the reason why this is, I, I, I try to track as much as I possibly can is I used to work in New Mexico on the Navajo Reservation. So uh, for 10 years, so I, I do have a, a vested interest in, in following up not only in COVID, but also uh, for, uh, for the Navajo Nation that I used to work for. So Winter Rock uh, had announced um, last week that they, um, had reported just 32 cases, but no additional de deaths, which is remarkable. And this is marks the seventh uh, time in 10 days that the tribe had reported no fatalities. And so this is much of what we are seeing, you know, not just locally to your own community or here in Milwaukee or in the state of Wisconsin, but more specifically uh, here in the Navajo uh, Reservation, uh, that the numbers are or going down. Obviously, they want to continue to uh, assure people's safety and, and promoting uh, mask wearing and, and vaccines. So it's important that people get updates to what's going on in our Native communities. And so uh, we all know that the Navajo Nation was impacted quite remarkably uh, initially and uh, now seems to be on even footing here in actually doing uh, fairly well. So what's, what's going on worldwide, globally, <clears throat> uh, is kind of interesting. So on top, these are weekly, the number of weekly cases that are, that are, that are noted. And this comes right out of John Hopkins' uh, COVID tracker. And so their weekly cases throughout the entire world collectively, you can see that the trend is going down. That last uh, peak there is, is Delta as it in, has impacted um, the entire globe. Um, and the number of fatalities are going down and we see the weekly administration of, of vaccines. So, um, you know, despite the cases of COVID going down and the fatalities going down, we also there's a, certainly a, a pretty good indication that the vaccines are trending down. So that's globally. Uh, what's going on back here in the United States? Um, we see our own uh, trend here and much of what is going on globally, we see what is going on exactly here as well. Uh, so we've had our peak, that last um, uh, you know, peak there is Delta. 
and the number of cases are going down. Uh, it has obviously peaked and and has been trending down for a good uh, a good month now. Uh, also, in the number of weekly fatalities is trending downwards as well. We look at the weekly administration of vaccines. Uh, we see that has has plateaued. But to get more granular as to what's going on here in the United States, uh, we hear about certain states having more cases than other, and and this is this comes from from the CDC. So we see in this. Uh, the top five states are Texas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and California. Uh, I put New York there with an X. Uh, that's New, uh, the state of New York as well as New York City, and combine that, that's about 33,000. So that actually pushes them up to being number three in the, uh, here in the United States. And we see this upper Midwest area. So we see Michigan uh, at number four. We see Minnesota. Uh, at number seven, we see Wisconsin's up there as well, as well as Illinois. Uh, so these uh, upper um, Midwest states um, obviously are seeing uh, our peak. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into that, but this is the trend that's going on here in, in the United States. I pulled this up um, off of the CDC website, and this is kind of important because um, we hear in the news all the headlines of all the bad outcomes, and, and this isn't certainly new, but um, to put perhaps a better perspective on this, uh, we see back in um, November, December, January, <clears throat> that was the, the UK variant uh, that was running rampant throughout the United States. And we see that there was a peak there. This is looking at new admissions, uh, uh, patients with confirmed COVID. We see that the peak, um, the seven day average was 16,500. Now just to kind of put that in perspective as to what we were seeing with Delta, uh, the peak of new admissions uh, with COVID was about uh, 12,300. So a little different. Um, there was quite an, an upsurge of new cases and uh, much like the last peak, that peak is also trending kind of at the same rate of decline as well. So admissions throughout the country here in the United States are going down. You can see on the left hand side there the, the rate of, of admissions here uh, percent change from the prior seven days average of September 24th to September 30th. So there's 11.4% decrease in admissions. Um, percent change from the peak um, average of January 3rd, 21 to January 9th of 2021, a 57%. So collectively, um, cases are going down, admissions are going down. And as a result, uh, obviously, the, the, the number of fatalities are going down. Now, I had talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago, the last time we, um, we were together here, I, as to what was on the horizon, what was coming up. Uh, I had mentioned that Pfizer uh, had uh, submitted its emergency use authorizations for kids 5 to 11. Um, also looking at... At that time, I had mentioned that there weren't any good studies out looking at data, particular about mixing vaccines between Pfizer, Moderna, and even Johnson & Johnson. So I have new information regarding that. And then as far as outpatient treatment, um, you know, there are um, antibody, uh, monoclonal antibody treatments that are out right now. Um, oral medications. Um, much like uh, I had mentioned about Tamiflu as it was treated, as it is treated for the flu, there are other oral uh, antiviral medications that are coming down. And in particular, I mentioned about Merck. So that was what I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, and I'll give you some updates as to what uh, is going on with this right now. Some other important dates, um, October 14th. So as of today, the FDA is meeting uh, to discuss the boosters regarding Moderna. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, the FDA will be meeting regarding boosters for Johnson & Johnson. 
So these, um, if you are interested in uh, observing this, there is a link to observe the, the advisory committee and I posted it here. Also on October 26, um, the FDA will meet to discuss Pfizer's request to authorize COVID-19 uh, vaccines for uh, five to 11 year olds. So today, after this, probably by the end of day, uh, we'll probably get a lot more information tomorrow about Johnson & Johnson and then Pfizer uh, vaccines for kids uh, the end of this month. So um, things are gonna be moving pretty fast. And uh, I find this you know, really interesting uh, at this moment because there's so much going on regarding not only just the vaccines, boosters and, uh, and the age group, but also this medication. Uh, I had mentioned that Merck was submitting, well, they, they have submitted, Merck has submitted their, um, their uh, oral antiviral medication uh, for emergency use authorization this past Monday, this week past Monday. So just to give you a little bit of background on this medication, uh, uh, molnupiravir, uh, this was first actually tested and used for uh, people with influenza as an antiviral. Uh, and how this medication works is it works by interfering with the way the, uh, the virus replicates inside our cells, um, causing mutations that kill the virus. So if the virus uh, it causes breaks in the link to, to propagate and replicate, uh, it, it can't continue to you know, grow and build and, and, and um, uh, replicate within our bodies to make us sick. So the antiviral medication breaks that cycle. And as a result, the body has a chance to pick up its immune system and destroy and recover. So one of the more important things I had mentioned is that it does, uh, there's a 50% reduction in hospitalizations as well as fatalities in unvaccinated adults infected with COVID-19. So uh, um, this is this is going to be this is uh, the first oral medication treatment uh, as an outpatient, uh, and it is going to really dramatically change how we look and view uh, COVID moving forward. Now, Tamiflu uh, it was an oral medication and uh, antiviral medication for influenza. And um, that was a great drug, um, is a great drug for treating people with influenza as long as you catch them early in the course of the disease. Now, that's going to follow the same way with, with COVID, is prescribing, uh, not only knowing, di being diagnosed with COVID, but early on in its disease um, uh, in, in symptom formation that you want to catch this, diagnose it, and be able to prescribe it and start taking this medication. So this is, um, this is going to be a really important decision that FDA is going to have. Um, and the, the eligibility, or at least who will be eligible to get this, are individuals that are at high risk, uh, adults that are at high risk, uh, in particular people over the age of 60, and people with health risk factors. And, and you know, I'll go through some of those, what those health risk factors look like. Uh, much of what those risk factors are applies to, you know, how we're even looking at boosters. So these profiles don't change. Risk is risk. Um, and if this pill is approved by the FDA, um, you know, they're, they, it, it is in their queue to discuss this medication could be readily available uh, to the general public uh, in a matter of weeks, in a matter of weeks. So this is really important. And millions of, of Americans could actually benefit from this medication right away. So this is gonna be really huge. Now, also on the horizon, I wanna bring this up now. Now I talked about the molnupiravir so this is a prescription. You would have to take four pills twice a day, BIDs twice a day for five days. So it's a 40 pill course. 
um, Merck feels that they can produce 10 million doses. 10 million doses mean uh, uh, prescriptions. So 10 million prescriptions, 10 million individuals by the end of the year. Our government currently has bought 1.7 million doses of this already right off the bat. So if it does come to fruition and this medication does get approved, um, this would be almost immediately available um, um, since we will get that first batch of doses. Now, interestingly enough, uh, it, we had to pay, the government, US government had to pay $1.7 billion, uh, almost $1,000 um, uh, a dose here. And so it is, um, you can say it's quite expensive uh, for, for a dose of, uh, uh, for this medication. Now, what's interesting also is Pfizer and Roche and uh, Aliyah pharmace uh, Pharmaceuticals also has a very similar antiviral medication. These are in uh, clinical uh, trials right now. The Pfizer uh, form is, has already started uh, and the Roshan uh, Elite Pharmaceuticals is looking at later this year. So Merck would be probably, would be the first uh, out on the market and then following that, uh, probably Pfizer and then Roche. And so these are important because uh, again, like I mentioned, this could change the curve uh, of how this how this virus runs in our communities and quite dramatically uh, change things almost immediately. So keep your, keep your eye uh, out on headlines regarding Merck in this new medication as well as the other ones as well. Now, I also mentioned um, the last time we, I talked about mixing uh, um, uh, vaccines. And at the time it was recommended, at least two weeks ago, the general thought was there's not enough information. And um, at that time, um, the feeling was there was no recommendation because no one really knew what the safety and efficacy of these mixing these uh, vaccines was, um, how this was gonna react. But, and this just really came out, um, um, when did it come out? It came out this morning. So I quickly tried to read up on it and at least try to give you the highlights to what this study is. There's going to be more information out there and there's going to be headlines on this, but uh, the U.S. did its first uh, kind of study that, on this to compare the effects of using different vaccines as boosters from the initial dose uh, of what people have gotten. So they stratified this. It's fairly complicated, a nine-arm trial involving 450 people. Not a whole lot, but again, uh, it's, it's probably one of the bigger studies that are currently out there that are, that's um, gonna be uh, scrutinized a lot. Now they measured the effects uh, from giving a booster shot of the Moderna, Pfizer, or Johnson & Johnson to those who had originally got something different. Now the overall results were that, uh, that they found was mixing and matching resulted in comparable or higher levels of neutralizing antibodies compared to the same vaccine uh, boosting. So bottom line is um, the mixing of however combination you want to look at did result in an increase, a bump up in the effects of neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies are what our bodies produce to counter the virus. So as a as a as a point of measuring effectiveness, uh, neutralizing antibodies um, is a good way of doing that. Now, what they also found out was the rates of adverse events were similar across all different booster groups. So, um, you know, if you if let's say I took Pfizer and I had some some side effects, you know, arm achiness, maybe fatigue. Um, the general thought was that if I was to get Moderna as my booster, not only will I get the effect of the booster, but I will also have very similar effects, uh, side effects with arm fatigue and, and tiredness uh, as a result. So this is actually a good, this is good news and it could certainly change the trajectory of how we look at boosters going forward. Right now, because it's only authorized for Pfizer, um, which 
essentially about half of the country has gotten Pfizer, the other half has gotten Moderna, and uh, a handful of people have gotten Johnson & Johnson. You know, could this change the discussion of how we look at boosters right now? Because I know people who have gotten Moderna are asking me, when can I get it? I want to get it. Where do I go to get it? Well, it's not authorized. They're talking about it as of right now, as well as Johnson & Johnson. So if boosters are going to be available, uh, after the, this week, the FDA says, hey, this is this is good. This is what we had hoped we would see. We could almost see an, an, an immediate floodgate of everyone uh, and being able to mix. But we'll wait until uh, Pfizer comes out with its, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the FDA comes out with its final um, recommendations and guidelines on mixing and matching when that comes. Now, here at our uh, agency, uh, our health center, we are um, we are providing boosters uh, for people who have, uh, who have taken Pfizer right now, and these are some of the age group eligibility. So, 65 and older, ages 18 and older, who li uh, who live in long-term care facilities, uh, individuals who have underlying medical conditions, people who work in high-risk settings, or who live in high-risk uh, high-risk settings. So. Um, I talked about, you know, what is what is a high risk individual look like? Well, <clears throat> much of what we've been talking about for many, many months here of, of, of what, what those underlying conditions look like. And you can see there's there's a lot of different um, underlying conditions that people fall into uh, that would put them at higher risk. So we know that even high blood pressure or even high cholesterol, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease uh, is pretty common uh, here in the United States. Um, so it's important to know and read and understand if you fall into that category, if you are looking for a booster, uh, what does that actually, uh, who qualifies? And you may find out that you may be one of these individuals that do qualify and would be eligible. And so I also talked about that eligibility of people who uh, work in high risk settings. Well, here are these occupations, at least in general, what high risk occupations would look like that would make you eligible. First responders, uh, educators, food and agricultural workers, manufacturing workers, correctional US postal, public transport and grocery stores. Uh, I think it goes without saying healthcare settings, anybody who works in healthcare settings would be eligible for that. So um, that's the eligibility for boosters. Pfizer is available right now. Uh, we offer those uh, boosters uh, right now. So now trying to bring this back home to us <clears throat> here in, in Milwaukee County. Here is a good profile, and I try to update this as much as possible. Uh, so this is looking at um, uh, the racial and ethnic uh, um, categories here in Milwaukee County. We see on the far left-hand side, the Asian population uh, has more than 50% of, of its population here in Milwaukee vaccinated, either by single or uh, fully vaccinated. The second group is the Native American population here in Milwaukee, uh, in Milwaukee County. Again, uh, nearly as equal to the Asian population, more than 50%, uh, over 57% have actually been fully vaccinized. So this is, these are really good information to follow uh, as it pertains to the Native community. Uh, Non-Hispanic white population followed by the Hispanic population in the African American community here. Uh, with 33% of the population uh, vaccinated. So um, this, this isn't new, this has been the trend. It has been the trend for, you know, almost as um, uh, once the vaccine started to be administered back in, in December, this trend has continued and has maintained this level uh, ever since. So there hasn't been any dramatic change uh, in these, in these, um, in this status um, for quite some time now. So uh, I had presented this before, and again, it still applies. Um, areas of high, high incidence rates of COVID to um, 
um, to all ages as well as to ages zero to 17, where are we seeing these younger population of, of cases? And so it is um, two focuses, one um, on the near north side and, and the second being further uh, south of, of, of Milwaukee, city of Milwaukee. So uh, two different categories, two different areas. When we look at ages zero to 17, we get slightly smaller concentrations of areas on the immediate north side as well as the south side near um, uh, South Milwaukee, uh, Oak Creek area. So I bring this up because it's gonna be important as I, as I finish here, where, where, what are the numbers uh, of cases that we're seeing by demographic? So keep this in mind here. So looking at what's going on in the states, uh, here we have individuals who've completed the vaccine on the left-hand side. This is all the age groups that are eligible, 54.5% um, uh, of 12 and older. If we look at just 18 and older uh, who have fully uh, completed the vaccine series, we're looking at 65.2% of the population of Wisconsin. In that middle table, um, you'll see the, the seven-day average. As you go to the far right hand side of this October 13th, so um, 6.4 million doses have been administered in the state of Wisconsin. And as of the last two weeks, the average, the seven day average has been 3,000, uh, 3,800 uh, doses uh, on the average. That's not a lot. That's not a lot of doses uh, or individuals that are being vaccinated right now. And so, the the rate of vaccination here in Wisconsin has been declining and probably declining even a little bit more than it would have normally. So it's kind of interesting how the dynamics are occurring with obviously with the mandates, at least here in Wisconsin, we're not seeing uh, the impact of, of that mandate uh, in the form of, of more, uh, of more um, uh, people getting vaccinated. So you know, take that as you will. Now on the bottom part here, this is the single dose 12 and older, uh, October 13th, the total number of individuals that have been vaccinated with a single dose by racial demographic. We look on the right hand side of this table, you see October 13th and what's in yellow. So 238 doses, uh, that is on the average for the past two weeks. So one week averaging 238 cases, that is not a lot of vaccines being administered. If you look at the Asian population, it's only 42. Um, African-American, almost 1,400. Hispanic population, 1,600. And for some reason, the state has recalibrated itself and the non-Hispanic white population lost about 5,000. So um, it's kind of interesting how this all works out and how the numbers uh, are laying out here, but you can see the trend isn't just one particular group, it's across the board for everybody. Uh, so that's, that's uh, what I'm seeing uh, here in, in the state of uh, Wisconsin. Again, as I mentioned, 6.4 million doses. <clears throat> just looking at where some of these doses are going are they going to the younger population of 12 to 15? Well, the answer is no, not really, um, because on the, the seven day average has been 191 doses being administered. Um, and that's really not a lot. It, it's just dramatically decreasing um, uh, across the board. So I had presented this before, uh, really giving the difference of individuals who've been vaccinated to being unvaccinated, uh, obviously in the category of, of being vaccinated, uh, the rate of infection is dramatically lower than people who are unvaccinated. And again, looking at the age groups of vaccinated to unvaccinated by age group, you can see just how important vaccines are and the differences between um, um, not only getting COVID, but also um, the rate of, of, of COVID in people who are unvaccinated. So 
this isn't new and, and um, but I wanted to bring it back and make sure that people have an understanding of where we are with vaccine. So looking at how we are doing uh, here in the United States um, as a whole, uh, this is vaccinated, this is fully vaccinated individuals looking at the total population as a whole, 56.6%. People over the age of 18, 68% individuals, uh, 65 and older, 84%. So um, I had mentioned months ago about trying to reach that level of, of herd immunity, that critical threshold where you start seeing market declines uh, in communities uh, based on vaccination or people who have gotten COVID and recovered or people who've had, who, who've been vaccinated and got COVID and recovered. It, it was going to take a while and it's still going to take a while because when we talk about herd immunity, we're not talking about a single demographic, a single community uh, or race or ethnic. We have, we have to look at the entire, um, uh, uh, population as a whole, so includes all ethnicities. So when we look at the total population, 56.6%, even if we thought that that critical threshold was about 50, oh, I'm sorry, 70%, we still have a ways to go. And I thought based on what I thought were projections and estimations is that we may not get to that 70% or that critical threshold until after the new year. And that seems to be kind of where we're going uh, at this moment. So here is um, daily doses of vaccines given. I'm given some high point uh, numbers here. Um, so back in uh, April, April 11th, um, the seven day average of 3.4 million to the down to the very low of July 9th, um, only 438,000. And since then we've had, you know, varying ups and down trends. The vaccine mandate, of course, uh, occurring and being implemented. We did see a bump up in the number of doses being given, um, but now we're starting to see a decline uh, once again. So what would be interesting is to see what happens with Pfizer with its 5 to 11 um, authorization request, and will that lead to another boost in, 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 the, in the vaccines that are being administered. And it could very well, we'll have to wait and see. What's interesting, I thought here, looking specifically at the native tribes of Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, you're probably hearing more in the news right now about Minnesota. Their numbers have dramatically gone up and, and that is true. And we're seeing that more dramatic and more of a highlight in the native population in the state of Minnesota as well, collectively, along with everyone else. So Michigan, now a little uh, over 6,000 cases, uh, 363 cases over the last two weeks or an average of 181 per week. 10.1% of the native population has now gotten, uh, has now gotten uh, COVID. What's interesting here in the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> well, I should say the last, uh, uh, in the last four weeks, the number of native cases in the state of Minnesota have dramatically gone up. And, and before, Wisconsin natives were of, of a higher total number. Well, in the last month, Minnesota's native tribe, uh, tribal uh, native uh, population has increased, almost doubled the amount of what we were seeing here in Wisconsin, and the numbers are almost uh, quite similar. So 775 new cases over the last two weeks, 388 on the average. This is really remarkable because, you know, there is a surge of cases in the state of Minnesota, and this is we know that no one's immune or absolved from getting COVID, and we're seeing that the native population in Minnesota is, is definitely getting um, getting their fair share of new cases. Now, with this total number, 11.3 percent of the native population in Minnesota, here in Wisconsin, uh, almost 40, 8,400 new uh, uh, total cases. Um, but 
We have a smaller population here, so 16.2% of the native population in the state of Wisconsin has now gotten COVID. So a uh, bit of a change and, and it's, it's, it's slightly has changed and then dramatically has, has bumped up in the last two weeks for Minnesota. Looking here at what's going on uh, in Wisconsin, the seven day average is now 2,318 and the number of cases are starting to trend downward. So much of what we've seen in, in the US where the peak of, co uh, of COVID uh, occurred about a month ago, five weeks ago. Um, we are now starting to see, we have peaked and now are starting our trend downward. So we're about two or three weeks behind the national average of what's going on. Nonetheless, we are on the downside here. I wanted to bring these graphs back because I still think it's important when we talk about COVID and the native population. Here in Wisconsin, <clears throat> uh, second in case, uh, case rates, second in hospitalizations, uh, in uh, highest fatality rates um, in the state of Wisconsin for natives. This has not changed since the beginning of, of when COVID started and, and is still um, pretty much, um, um, I, I don't see this changing and this will, um, this, this, will, this will be a stat that doesn't change in the state of Wisconsin, I feel. Now, looking at the number of cases for individuals 18 and younger. Native population, number one in the state in terms of case rate. Now, the caveat here is I will say that the, the case rate for the, the younger population is, is going down. Um, and it's going down across the board for all uh, races and ethnicities. Um, the other takeaway from this, when I look at this bar graph at the bottom, is the case rate is decreasing across the board for all individuals um, 18 and younger. So that's important to know because and this kind of goes along with what I presented a few slides ago is, you know, we peaked um, about two weeks ago and we're starting to see the trend going down. So is that trend going down related to the uh, our 18 and younger rates? Uh, is the trend going down because of this age group? And the answer is more than likely, yes, it is. Now, with higher cases uh, of, of COVID in, in less than 18, does that necessarily translate into hospitalizations? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Um, so here we have in the, if you follow the orange line, uh, you see that's the native population. And there's always these fluctuations, dramatic fluctuations up and down. And that could be the, the matter of, of, of cases of being either one or two, you would see these bump up zero cases. It actually goes down to the bottom. But just as a comparison, the other uh, demographic uh, of African-Americans, 11.9 uh, cases per 100,000. Currently, there's 14, at least 14 documented cases of being hospitalized, where in the native population, there has been none. So you can see just the slightest one or two cases can make a dramatic difference in the native, uh, uh, native population case rate. So as of right now, uh, high cases in the native youth doesn't translate into uh, hospitalizations. Now this one is, is gonna take a little, uh, a moment here, but I wanted to orientate you to what I'm seeing. So on the top half is September 29th. These, and you look to the right half of the top, you'll see the age demographics and the number of cases uh, by, by uh, age group. So the number one age group was 10 to 19 years of age with 8,000 cases. That was the number number one age group, uh, followed by the 30 to 39, and then um, kind of a tie between the 20 year olds and 40 year olds. Interestingly enough, though, uh, the the rate 
uh, percentage of new cases, you can see there was a dramatic shift from older age to the 10 to 19 year olds with the highest uh, case rate. So now looking at the bottom half, if you look on the right bottom half, you'll see what does that look like now for the past two weeks since September 29th. Well, the 10 to 19 year olds still are the number one, the 30 year olds are the number two, and now the 40 year olds uh, are number three, 20 year olds, and then the 50 year olds. But again, we're still seeing this, this shift between older, the percentage of new cases are shifting from the older to the younger population. And so uh, that's, that's, um, um, that is what the numbers here in the state of Wisconsin are showing. Um, now, interestingly enough, there's been one fatality in the 10 year olds and four in the 20. Now, in previous weeks, this tend not to be the case because normally we wouldn't see a case, a fatality case of, of anybody really old, younger than the age of, of 20. And now we've kind of seen a bump up in, the, in that number. I hadn't heard anything in the news as to the circumstances around these individuals, um, but it, unfortunately, there has been a reported fatality in in a uh, 10 to 19 year old age group, and at least four new ones in in the 20 year olds. So these are a slightly different change in the last two weeks in in that rate because historically, um, historically there hasn't been any. I haven't really reported on because there really hasn't been. They're so sporadic. So with that, uh, Jeremiah. <clears throat> I'll turn this back to you and certainly address and open this up for any comments or discussions that uh, may come up. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Nace. So actually, while we we're uh, you know, giving your presentation, you mentioned um, Moderna would be up for review today. There uh, just about an hour ago, I think right when you maybe went on the air, uh, FDA came out and said they have or recommended uh, emergency use authorization of the Moderna booster. Um, so with with that being said, what, you know, from your experience, what are the, the next steps um, after this to kind of, you know, actually get shots in arms kind of thing? Sure. So um, with this, um, the advisory group, then the FDA itself would would certainly put its stamp on, on what the advisory group puts forth. The next step is now the CDC and their advisory group will report out to the CDC um, and CDC will now put its final, compile everything and kind of give its final uh, decision and guidance and recommendations um, on what this is. So CDC probably won't meet until next week. Uh, they may say immediately or they may give it another week. So um, we may be looking at the week of Halloween. I don't have my calendar in front of me, but uh, let me see if I was to guess the date. Um, they may come out immediately or say, hey, start October 25th. Uh, people who've gotten Moderna are now eligible to get boosters for Moderna. I'm sure they'll follow very similar profiles as to what Pfizer has listed. Uh, I don't think there will be much deviation from that at all. So uh, we could see this um, maybe as early as, you know, October 19th or 20th and uh, or, you know, maybe as late as October 25th to start um, boosters, uh, vaccines in arms, October 25th. That sounds awesome, especially for those like myself who got Moderna. Yeah. Um, so uh, another question I had, and this is kind of um, just more about, you know, kids back at school, occasionally the, you know, the uh, cases are still um, showing up here and there. Um, so let's say you have a family of, you know, whatever number you've got, you've got a kid, a young kid who maybe hasn't been vaccinated yet. So in that five to 11 range, or even mm -hmm. younger, you know, say four to 11, and they come home, they have, uh, you know, the fever, they got the, the symptoms, get tested, they, they've got COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the kind of 
protocols for the rest of the family members. And I'll say, you know, the rest of the family members have all been vaccinated. Um, no one's showing symptoms. Yes. Do they, can they kind of uh, go on their daily, you know, on with their daily lives? Can they go to work? Can they go to, um, you know, hang out with other other family? Um, you know, should the, the, the kid, who, you know, who has COVID kind of be completely quarantined for X amount of days? Um, just kind of curious about that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting point because, in, in, you know, the, I know what CDC would say is the whole family would need to quarantine. But in practicality, that's probably not what's happening. Uh, we're probably having parents uh, or household uh, adults um, um, maybe going out and having to work. And so the kid stays home. Somebody stays with the, uh, with the child. So, um, you know, these, what we know um, for younger kids is that it tends to be milder in nature. Uh, and the risk of transmission is actually lower in kids than in adults. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why. There hasn't been really declared as to why. But the rate of transmission from, adult, uh, from kids to adults is actually lower than it is uh, vice versa. So, but that's not to say that you shouldn't, uh, you should at least try to maintain some level of of isolation in the house. I know that's gonna be hard, especially with uh, young ones uh, that need their parents to help, um, you know, even with, you know, normal stuff of feeding and, you know, just comfort and care, you know, it's gonna be pretty hard to do that at home knowing your child has COVID. Um, you know, they would, they would tend to say, you wear a mask when you're, uh, engaging in any face-to-face uh, -face interaction. Uh, it's going to sound a little weird to do at home, but it, you know, maybe at the peak of, of your child's illness, uh, maybe that would be best. And, and a watchful eye uh, on how they're doing and watch for their signs and symptoms. But yeah, I mean, it happens. It happens all the time. Uh, I suspect that a lot more individuals are probably uh, are going to work, uh, um, parents are going to work as being vaccinated. They may be covering up, which I would recommend that they do uh, until um, the acute phase of, of COVID is, is done within the house. All right, Dr. Nace. Um, so with that, uh, just to kind of loop back around, I know we had mentioned, or you had mentioned at the beginning um, about uh, you know, the Gerald L. Ignace Indian Health Center providing boosters. Could you just provide a little more detail on that? And then uh, I'll leave you with that as our, you know, our final word for the day. Sure. So uh, um, just as as much as I follow and track everything that, that has been going on, not just with the vaccines, but COVID in general, um, the biggest thing that, that I... Um, have always been concerned about is being prepared, uh, being prepared as much as possible for what I feel is, or at least anticipate what's going to happen. You know, we have vaccines for, you know, the primary series to be fully vaccinated as well as vaccine for boosters. Uh, we've supplied ourselves enough for Pfizer as well as, uh, um, you know, for individuals that have gotten Moderna, we're prepared. Uh, knowing and anticipating that this is th that this boosters were coming, uh, we've prepared ourselves to be able to handle everyone that we have vaccinated at our facility. Uh, we are fully prepared and ready to uh, to give boosters to individuals that uh, would like to get one. So uh, I put this slide back up because this is the current eligibility: 65 and uh, years of age and older, regardless of, of condition. 18-year-olds uh, uh, with underlying, 18 and older with underlying uh, conditions, uh, people who are at high risk, um, uh, uh, who work in high risk settings or who have uh, high risk uh, conditions um, uh, within their home. These are the eligibilities. I'm, I'm assuming that Moderna will be following the same line of, of thinking that uh, for, the, for Pfizer, 
But again, we are prepared. Our phone number is 414-383-9526. And once Moderna does finally get approved, which it looks like it will, we'd be fully able to accommodate uh, these requests as they come through. Um, So a couple things, boosters, outpatient uh, antiviral treatments with Merck, Pfizer, Roche, uh, all coming down the pipe. Um, You know, the numbers of, of, of cases are trending downwards, the fatalities are trending downwards, not just here in the United States, but globally. Um, this marks probably a, a critical point in time where um, there's a good chance that we would be able to dramatically decrease not only the rate of transmission, but also uh, poor outcomes as a result uh, with having outpatient treatments like um, what uh, um, uh, uh, um, coming uh, hopefully come sooner than later um, as an antiviral oral medication, but we'll have the full uh, full capability of being able to address people, not just to be vaccinated, but also for individuals who, who get COVID and, and to treat them and prevent um, severe disease or, or hospitalization. So this is a critical point in time, and I'm looking to the FDA and the CDC to make some right decisions here uh, and expedite these decisions fairly quick to get this uh, to people. So um with that being said um i will always be available to and 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 be able to talk about all of the new information that is coming out uh and hopefully anticipate and maybe give you uh maybe some insight into future thoughts and and what's going on uh with covid right now so um right now boosters are coming they're here um, if you're not vaccinated, we'd be more than happy to get you vaccinated. And um, until next time, everyone, uh, stay strong.